informational kickoff for the Portland Clean Energy Fund's second round request for proposals. My name is Sam Bross, and I'm the program manager for the Portland Clean Energy Fund, and I'm excited here to be presenting alongside my colleague, our deputy program manager, Katie Lister. Now, I remember being here last year and saying how much community effort, staff effort, and the effort of folks like you went into in shaping our program and, and bringing us to this point. And, and that effort still remains the same today, and it's incredibly important for where we are and to get us to where we are. But we're back here at the start of our application window and ready to help you bring life to, the, to your ideas for addressing climate change and advancing racial and social justice. So we're excited and hope you are too. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and, and jump into the, the purpose of the session today. So overall purpose of the session is to guide you through all the steps in the application process. And so you start out knowing the core basics, who can apply for funds, what the funds can be used for, how to prepare and submit your application, how your application will be reviewed by staff. And then we'll share a little bit about the application assistance that we have offered for you all. And lastly, we're, gonna, we're here to make sure we're able to answer the questions you have and make sure you have a path to getting answers to the questions that come up for you down the road. Thank you. So just want to start with making sure we do a quick just overview of our guiding principles. Now, these are the values that are reflected in throughout our scoring criteria and guide the decision making of the Portland Clean Energy Fund Committee, our nine person volunteer committee, which ultimately makes the funding recommendations to city council. And they are that the program is at its core climate action, but focusing on multiple benefits. And you'll see that through the scoring criteria in that the application places a lot of value on greenhouse gas emissions, climate resiliency, health, as well as all the numerous other benefits that are critical to our communities that have historically been left out of, of, of climate projects. Our program is justice driven and that the program centers and elevates the leadership and climate solutions from communities that bear the greatest impacts from climate change. These are communities of color and low income communities, low income people. The program is community powered and that those most impacted by climate change are the ones that need to be driving the solutions. And lastly, we wanna make sure we are accountable and that, 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 that plays through in our scoring criteria as well as our processes to make sure that our applications are driving the best quality benefits to communities so that we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions and advancing racial and social justice. So in the next few slides, we're just gonna talk about the basics. What is the grant funding opportunity? And make sure you have an overview of that, the, the core eligibility criteria for who is eligible to apply, and then the timeline, so you know when to expect different things. Next slide. So the who, and we're gonna talk a little bit about more, a little bit about this more later, but the, the grant application is, is, is for nonprofit organizations. And in this cycle, we're offering and have available 60 million for climate solutions that center leadership from our priority populations. And those are people with low incomes as well as people of color. And for our workforce and contractor development projects, it's a little broader. It's women, people of color, people with disabilities and people with low income. And our, our projects, our, our funding is available for projects within the city of Portland. So we'll get into that later, but generally means that if you're doing something that, that's a physical improvement at a site or something where you're, you're putting something in the soil, you're building something on a building, it needs to be within the city of Portland boundaries. If you're training people, they need to be city of Portland residents. Next slide. Now, the why. It's incredibly important that we acknowledge that those closest to the impact have the solutions to transition us to a greener, healthier, more resilient city. And the actual 60 million that we have available is, is, is across a several different funding areas. And so we'll dig into these later, but I'll just call them out here. Well, it comes back later, but it's 40 to 60% of the funds are gonna be going towards clean energy projects. About 20 to 25% of the fund is going towards workforce development and contractor support projects. 10 to 15% towards green infrastructure and sustainable agriculture projects. And 5% for innovation. These are really projects that do not neatly fit into the other categories, but otherwise reduce greenhouse gas emissions and advance racial and social justice. And we're gonna dig into what we mean by each of these categories in the next couple of slides as well.
We touched on this earlier, but the eligibility. The program is steered towards nonprofit organizations. So it is ultimately a nonprofit organization that has to be the primary applicant for the program. Now they can partner with other nonprofit organizations, with private businesses, as well as with government. But the primary applicant and the, the one that we ultimately create our grant agreement with as a city is the not, it must be a nonprofit organization. And here are a few things. They have to be designated as a 501C or 521A nonprofit by the federal government. They have to be registered with the Oregon Secretary of State as a nonprofit, and, and they cannot be on the disqualified charities list for the state. Now, we acknowledge that there are many small groups that are coming up into the space and eager to do this work and, and do this work on behalf of community. And so that if for that reason, those smaller groups, informal groups, maybe groups, uh, maybe a nonprofit without the capacity to do the administration can apply for the funds through a nonprofit fiscal sponsor. And we have a link here on our slides that provide a little bit of guidance on that. And this slide deck will be available at the end of the presentation posted online. So you can go through and, and click any of the links that you see here as well. That's an important acknowledgement. But we're gonna dig a little bit more into what fiscal sponsorship means for folks, since we know that that may be relevant for many of the folks here. Now, again, to be eligible to receive PCF funding, an organization needs to be registered as a nonprofit. Again, fiscal sponsorship is a way for informal groups to access the funding, administrative support of a larger organization or other benefits by partnering with a 501C registered organization. Just, just a piece of feedback. It's gonna be important that you have good relationships and written agreements between the fiscal sponsor and informal group. So if you're here today and you wanna apply but are not a nonprofit and seeking that out, that's something you're gonna to wanna to think about over the course of the next you know, 50 days or so we have left. When accepting a grant, if you are applying to a fiscal sponsor, our grant agreement from the city is ultimately with that fiscal sponsor but that's how, but and, and you, it's important you have an agreement because that fiscal sponsor then pay, you know, provides funding through them to the informal group. And we do acknowledge that uh, fiscal sponsors may request a fee for their services and within our grants, you can budget up to 10% of the total grant amount for your fiscal sponsor um, to account for those services. So we're gonna go through the dates here a little bit and make sure you're grounded in what are the key dates that, that are important for you to know. We released the RFP last Tuesday, September 28th, and our applications are gonna be due November 30th. And I, I, I've, I've gotta check the exact date, but November 30th, 2021 um, and, and at 11.59 p.m. So it'll be important you start early as it is, it is the, the, there's different pieces of the application you're gonna to need to gather and it's gonna be important you have that time. Once the application period closes, staff are gonna begin doing the eligibility review to make sure that all the applicants are eligible and the projects meet our basic eligibility criteria. Then we're gonna do our technical review for projects that do have those other technical elements with physical improvements. And then we're gonna begin our initial scoring. And we'll talk more about this later, but it's gonna be important that applicants are ready that around about middle of February for, for the applications that go to scoring panels, we're gonna give applicants an opportunity to respond to their initial scores. So we'll do the work. And so just as, as you plan your timeline and you look at this timeline, it's important to think about and make sure that you have staff available between that mid-December to, to early February window where we will follow up and give folks about, um, give folks a, a handful of, the, about a week, five business days or so to respond to their initial scores. And once we do that, we'll go through the rest of the process and we expect to announce awards in spring of 2022 begin dispersing awards immediately after that, but that'll roll through the summer of 2022 where we, 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 we disperse the awards. Right. And so maybe before I go ahead and move to the, the, the move to this next section, I just wanna pause and see if there are any clarifying questions. I'm not seeing any in the chat, but, um, but, in, but if there are, I encourage folks to type those in and we can come back to those later as well. All right, so in the next section, we're gonna dig a little deeper into making sure you have a good understanding of what you should apply for. So we're gonna get into the funding categories, the different types of grants that we have, as well as our funding targets. So you have a good sense for that. And this is gonna be all important information as you think about your project and, and, and just how you wanna structure your project and, the, and how you wanna apply for it. Okay. 
So these are our funding categories. This is that circular diagram you saw earlier. So your funding request, it's important to know, must fall within one of these funding categories. So it, it either has to be a clean energy project, these are renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, and there's a couple examples to the side. They have to be either green infrastructure or regenerative agriculture projects. There's a few examples to the, in the column to the right. They've got to be workforce development and contractor support projects or, or contractor support projects. Or they can be innovation or other projects. Again, these are projects that don't neatly fall in these other categories, but support the program goals by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and advancing racial and social justice. And so this is where we particularly see transportation projects, and we've called those out this year, that there is a 1.5 million set aside for transportation projects that don't fall because they don't fall in our other categories. And so that, that, that's where we expect them to take place. And so just come back to this if, you, if you're seeking those examples. All right. So now the types, and so we just spoke to the funding categories, and these are the, the kinds of projects have to fall in alignment with those. These are now the different types of grants you can apply for. You can apply for either a planning grant, which is to the left here, and those are for proposals up to $100,000, up to one year in implementation. And the idea is you're, you're planning. You've got an idea. You don't quite have the, enough to build out a full budget, a full scope for that, you know, a full plan for that idea, that idea, but you need to workshop that idea a little bit more and get more information, work with consultants, whatever it may be. And so those are planning grants. They're meant to help you plan, but not do any implementation. That's an important thing to know. And then we have our implementation grants. And so there are a handful of those, and each of these correspond to different scoring criteria. So we have small standard grants up to 500,000. Those can be up for up to three years in duration. And those are for your, your clean energy, your regenerative ag or green infrastructure projects or innovation projects. We have large standard grants. Now, it's a different application. Those are, again, for your clean energy projects, your green infrastructure and regenerative agriculture projects, your innovation projects. But the difference here is those are for projects from $500,000 to $10 million. And then we have our small workforce and contractor development grants. Those are for projects up to $500,000. And we have our large workforce and contractor development grants. And those are for projects from $500,000 to $10 million. And so for each of these different applications, there's slightly different questions or maybe different scoring criteria. And, and we do anticipate that folks within implementation grants may be doing a portion of planning. So it's just there's, and we'll get through a little bit more of that nuance here shortly. Now this slide is really important. This is gonna speak to what, when we come to the end of our process here with our committee with city council, we're gonna to wanna to present them with a package of grants. And so this is ultimately the portfolio or sort of the, the, the package of grants that we're looking to fund. We're seeking to fund the package of 75 grants this cycle. That breakdown for those 75 grants is about 20 to 25 planning grants, 30 to 40 small grants. So those are the implementation grants that are you know, less than $500,000. And 15 to 25 large grants. Those are the implementation grants that are between $500,000 and $10 million. And so that's the mix that we're hoping to fund. And for planning grants, to give you a sense, that would amount to maximum 2.5 million since each of those may be up to $100,000. The chart to the bottom left shows that diagram that across those different grant types, we're looking for a balance of 24 to 36 million going towards clean energy projects, 12 to 15 million going towards workforce development and contractor support projects. So it's focused on the, the, these sectors. We're looking for six to nine million going towards green infrastructure and sustainable agriculture projects. And then about three million going towards innovation projects. And this is where we do have a, a 1.5 million set aside for, um, for transportation projects. It's out of that innovation category. Next slide. So in the next two slides, this slide and the following slide, we're gonna give a little bit of a um, highlight, a handful of things that the fund can pay for and cannot pay for as part of uh, a grant. And this is not meant to be exhaustive. It's really meant to highlight some of the ways in which we want you to think about this and we're trying to call out some things you may not have thought were eligible to be funded um, and some things that it's important you know cannot be funded. So I just wanna acknowledge that this is not exhaustive as you have questions 
please email us. You'll see our email in several places, cleanenergyfund at portlandoregon.gov. So I'm going to call out a couple of lists on, on this green check mark to the left. Something we want to call out. You can pay for expenses associated with maintaining an investment over its lifetime. Give an example, if you're planting trees, for instance, that could look like wad, that could look like paying for folks for, you know, making sure you have a maintenance agreement so that folks can go back and water those trees for the next three or four years to make sure that they're established and that we, we achieve the greenhouse gas projections that, that we originally modeled, making sure that those trees stay alive. So you can add that investment or account for that in your grant agreement. You could have a warranty package to make sure that the inverters on your solar panels are replaced at some point down the line so that it, it continues doing what it needs to do. So those are eligible expenses within your grants, within your grant application. Another thing is project reporting. We ask for a lot of reporting and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's important that you think about any project reporting costs because those are real costs, those take time, and it's important that you can call those out as a specific uh, line item expense and not assume that that's part of your overhead. Some things that cannot be, some examples of how funds cannot be used. Can't purchase materials, supplies, or activities that are not in service to or relevant to the particular project that you're proposing. You can't, you can't just add that in. And then, um, you know, an example here we give is that for folks uh, proposing to the workforce development program, you, you can only provide, you can only pay for the folks that are Portland residents. So if you've got a program and you've got city of Portland residents, Washington County residents, your grant, the grant funds are you can't apply to pay for Washington County residents. It's going to have to be proportional to your city of Portland residents. I'll give you a couple examples. Slide. And now we're going to dig into a few more of these in more detail. Now, all of these sit on our grant guide page, which um, I, I'm assuming many of you have seen. So this all exists there, but we want to call a few things out. Again, you, you spoke to this earlier, the fiscal sponsor, you can charge up to 10% of your project expenses for your fiscal sponsor fee. For any travel, for your overhead costs, we've got a couple different ways you can, you can, you can charge your overhead. For, for travel, materials, and contract costs that, that you're projecting for your project, you can charge up to 10% overhead for those costs. For all other costs, including your personnel, you can charge up to 20% for overhead. For folks coming in with a fiscal sponsor, the combined overhead and fiscal sponsorship rate should not be more than 25%. And we can explain this and talk folks through this. For folks thinking about land or building acquisition, they are eligible under certain circumstances. The, it, they, they have to be directly related to one of our funding areas and they have to be primarily related to the project. To give an example, you could do land acquisition for community solar projects since you have to have land to put the community solar there. But you can't pay for land acquisition to build an affordable housing uh, project, even though you may have green energy or clean energy components of that affordable housing project. So it really has to be the land acquisition has to be directly related to the PCEF project, not indirectly. Okay. And then for new construction and building improvements, this is sort of our offering for folks that are thinking about doing or building out a really efficient building, what we generally call these as net zero. They buildings that produce as much energy over the course of a year as they consume. And so if you're thinking about building or developing a building or renovating a building to that level of standard, you can charge and budget up to 30% of the total project cost, including land acquisition, design, and development to your PCEF grant. Grant funds invested in non-residential properties. So these are private commercial buildings that, that are not owned by the, the nonprofit organization are gonna be capped at about $100,000 unless those investments are loans that, are, that will be repaid. And building improvements that are not directly related to the energy efficiency, renewable energy, or green infrastructure measures are allowable, but they cannot exceed 30% of the total construction budget per site, and they have to address the life, health, or safety issues. But so just a few things to think about and to, to remember before you apply. One, people ask us all the time, you can apply for multiple grants, but each grant application has to be able to stand out on its own. You can't, one grant can't be dependent on getting the other. So each grant application has to be independent, but you can apply for multiple grants. Planning grants should not include implementation, but implementation grants can include some aspects of planning. 
And we expect that. Oftentimes, in the beginning of a project, you've got to tease a few details out. All workers paid using PCEF funds, and this includes your subcontractors or consultants, must be paid at least 180% of area minimum wage. This is $26.55 per hour as of July 1st, 2022. Items purchased or services procured prior to the grant agreement cannot be reimbursed, and PCEF funded improvements cannot be used as a basis for rent increases. And lastly, some types of property obtained with our funds, either in full or part, may require the grantee to notify the city if they'd like to transfer that property, both notify and, and receive approval from the city if they'd like to do that. So with that, before I send folks off to the next section and to hear from my esteemed colleague, I'm gonna go ahead and pause and see if I see some of the clarifying questions. I see one question here. And the question is, is that per year or for multi-year grants the total? This is in the context of the funding targets. Thank you. So this is earlier when I think you saw the, the clean energy projects is 40 to start 60% of the funding. And we showed that for that category, that would have been 24 to 36 million. So that is specifically for this round. But when someone applies, an organization may decide, I'm going to apply for $3 million for a three-year project. And so that, and that project is going to spend $1 million each year. So that entire allocation would come out of this year. And so that, that 24 to 36 million for clean energy projects is uh, it's what we will award this year, but it is for the entirety of the, the grant agreement that you'd be applying for. That may be confusing, and please follow up with an additional question if, if that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Then I'm gonna go ahead and pass things on to Katie to, to bring us into the next section. Great. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Um, and I'm going to go through um, the this next section, which has a lot of pictures and um, hopefully should go read relatively quickly. And it really is just talking about preparing your application, how to choose your grant type, making sure that you download the right grant application and have all of the material that you need to apply gathering information and writing your application responses, and then how to submit your grant application. So this slide we know has a lot of boxes and circles and arrows on it and might seem a little overwhelming. It really is in here as a reference so that you can look at it um, after this presentation when you're and kind of walk through it um, to be able, as a decision tree, to be able to, thinking about your own project, figure out what kind of grant application you, um, you need to fill out. So we'll just, just know that this is here as a tool for you. And in this slide, we'll just walk through an example of how you might use it. So you just first ask yourself, does the project fall within one or more of the PCEF funding categories? And again, those categories are clean energy, that's energy efficiency and renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, green infrastructure, innovation or other, or workforce and um, contractor development? And if the answer is yes, then the next question is, is your project fully or mostly developed and ready to go? Do you have enough information that you're able to scope out um, the project well enough to develop a budget that um, seems reasonable to implement the project. Even if there are still some planning activities, like Sam said, it's okay if there are still some planning activities, but, um, but you don't wanna be at the very beginning of the process. So if the answer to that is yes, you, think, you feel like you know enough to put a budget together, then, then you go down and ask yourself, is your project primarily focused on implementing a workforce and contractor development program? or some other type of project. Um, and what we mean by primarily is really what it comes down to is your budget. Is the majority of your if, is the majority of your budget primarily focused on workforce or contractor development? If the answer is no, then is your is the majority of your budget or your project primarily focused on implementing a clean energy, regenerative agriculture, green infrastructure, or innovation projects? And hopefully the answer to that is yes. Um, if it's not focused on workforce and contractor development. And then it just is a matter of answering the question, how much money do you need to implement your project? 
If you need $500,000 or less, then you'll fill out the standard small grant application. If you, if you needed more money than that, then you would have gone over to the standard large grant application. So once you know what kind of application you should fill out to apply for your to apply for your grant, then on our website on the apply for a grant page, you, you will see a button and you can choose to download the planning grant application, the small standard grant application, the large standard grant application, or there's just one grant application for workforce and contractor development projects. And there's a little bit of variation in how those are evaluated and how the criteria apply to workforce and contractor development grants, but it's the same set of questions. So there's just one application for those types of projects. So you download the application packet for your grant type. And this is just a screenshot of what you would see. On the right-hand side, there, you would be brought to um, a window that would allow you to see everything that was in was um, within that packet and to download that to your computer. So this is a, in this example, this is for the standard small grant application, and you would see an application checklist, application the, uh, the application questions, a sample grant agreement, and the clean energy project requirements. If your project is not a clean energy um, project, then you can just ignore those requirements. But if you are, if you do have a clean energy project, you're going to want to make sure that you read those. Just a couple of notes on some of the um, documents in here. The sample grant agreement also has, as an attachment to it, um, a work the workforce and contractor mm -hmm. equity agreement. And be sure and look at that because those are requirements that you, if you're awarded funding, will need to agree to. In, um, in that relate to the workforce that you're going to hire and the contractors and subcontractors that you might hire. A couple of notes about the application questions document. That document has all of the application questions and it also has links to all of the forms that you might need to fill out, including the budget template um, to be able to complete your grant application. And at the very end of that document, there's also the tables which have the scoring criteria that are relevant for that grant application. So there's a lot of information in there, but hopefully it's it's pretty easy to navigate. And if if there are questions come up, as always, just reach out to, to staff. So this is an example of what you might see um, downloading the planning grant application. There's fewer, fewer, it's a, you know, there's fewer documents, it's a simpler um, application. It's the smallest of the grants, so there's a, um, a little bit less required. So there's three documents in there. There's the application checklist, and that's really just for you to use. You don't have to submit it. It just is to make sure that you have everything included, everything that you need to include in your application packet. And then there's that planning grant application. Again, that is really, it's a reference document. It has all of the application questions and sort of queries for information that you'll need to respond to, and then the sample grant agreement, again, with that um, attachment that is the workforce and contractor equity agreement. The next two slides are just screenshots that you can use for reference when you, when you do go to the website and click the button that downloads your packet. Just if you want, you can come back to this presentation and make sure that you're seeing in your packet everything that you see on this slide. These are all of the documents that should be in that packet. And this is an example for the standard small grant application. Again, this is, um, there is some sort of, they're color coded to hopefully um, try and help people find their way a little bit more easily. And this is the workforce and contractor development um, application for both large and small grants. There's really no difference in the way that you fill out the application, whether you're um, applying for a large grant or a small grant, it just is some variation in how um, your application is scored. And you can see that in, at the very bottom of that application in the tables that I referenced, um, the tables that have the scoring criteria in them, it will note where the differences are in how the application will be scored depending on if it's a large grant or a small grant for the workforce and contractor development grants. And then once you are all ready and you've written up your, your proposal and um, collected your documents, the required documents, there are a couple of options for submitting your application. 
We do have an online application portal, and we do prefer that people submit their applications through that portal. That um, It should be very easy to use and, um, and relatively simple. If you are not comfortable using the portal or you don't have access to it for some reason, you can also submit your, your application material for, um, via email to cleanenergyfund at portlandoregon.gov. Um, or you can even submit your application if you want to print and mail it um, if, if you don't have access to those two other ways. And we just wanted to call out here that um, in, with this solicitation, we are allowing, we are letting people submit um, videos that, to sort of supplement their application. It's not a requirement, and your application will certainly not be penalized or scored poorly if you don't include a video but we wanted to offer the opportunity for people to tell their stories or sort of supplement their story using that, using a video format. Um, there is some guidance on our website that is that sort of provides some tips and some guidance around how, what we would like to see in a video, no more than seven minutes. And um, just make sure that you include the link in, you know, in your application material, the link to where that video is posted, and if there are any passwords needed to access it, make sure and include those too. This is a screenshot of the application portal. And this can be, this again is accessed through that, through our website, through the apply for a grant here page, the same page that where you would click the button to download your application packet. If you scroll just a little further down, you'll get to the button that links to the portal. And in the application portal, you'll have um, an option to, you'll see these three options. If you wanna apply for a standard grant, a workforce and contractor development grant or planning grant. And so you choose one of those. You will have to have, um, you, you do have to sign up for an account to, with the city to be able to access the portal, but it is very quick. Um, if you run into any difficulties with it, there is, uh, an email, an email right on there that you can, you know, ask for help, or you can contact us directly, and we can we can walk you through it. Once you have an account and you're logged onto the portal, you can save your app. You can work on your application and save it, and then return to it. And you can also, when you log on, you will see a dashboard. So if you're applying for more than one grant, you might see that you have started a planning grant application and that you have also started a standard grant application with whatever title you give those grant applications. And then you can click into those and, um, and continue working on them. This is kind of what the inside of um, the application portal looks like. The only information that we're asking this time be entered into fields in the application portal is what we're calling section zero. So when you open up, when you download your application packet and you open up all of the application questions, the first set will be called section zero. In planning grants, I believe it's about 17 questions in the um, standard large, which is has the largest number of questions. I think it's 28. And so, it's a lot of basic eligibility questions. Um, there's a lot of sort of selecting yes or no, and, um, and then also entering some information about your organization, including your organizational demographics go into this section. And then sections one through five, if it's planning grant, or one through six, if it is um, one of the, if, if it's one of the implementation grants, this, we wanted to create more flexibility than we had last time. We got feedback from grantees last time that they wanted to be able to have a little bit more control over how they formatted and told their story. And so you really just need to work in whatever software you're comfortable in, if it's Google Docs or Word or whatever, and just save it as a PDF and upload that as your main application. And that is um, just answering all of the information requests or questions um, that are in section one through five or one through six of the application. Very last section of the application actually is the budget template. So that you just sort of click on the link to download the budget template and fill that in and then upload it with your application. This actually shows a screenshot of where um, in the bottom there, in the bottom section there of the slide, you can see a screenshot of, of where you would upload your application material. So in this, um, in this screenshot, we have selected for the attachment type, the RFP response, and that is 
the main body of your application um, that you have developed in Word maybe and saved as a PDF and you choose RFP response and then you just upload that file. And that's in this, that's in section two of the um, portal and it's called the accompanying um, documents. And you can see, this is an example um, that just kind of shows what it looks like once someone has uploaded all of the documents that they're gonna upload for their um, application. There's a budget in there, there's the RFP response, there's the financials. You can remove um, documents if you update something and um, you know, you can want to come back later and have an updated version in there, or you accidentally update or upload the wrong thing, you can remove it and replace it. You can also choose attachment type other if you want to provide supplemental information that is not like pictures or just other documents that are not listed there, just put those under other and then choose the file and click the upload button. Um, this is pretty, it's pretty easy and it does accept most file types. Um, we, I think the only file type that we that it can't accept is Word. And so, but it can accept Excel documents, PDFs and sort of, and image files. So if, um, and again, if anyone runs into issues when they get to this point, they can always contact um, staff and we'll help you get it figured out. Once you have everything, all of your section zero information entered and all of your attachments uploaded, then you move on to the review and submit um, section of the portal. And there's a review button. If you click that, you'll see this red bar if there's something missing from your application. So if one of the required fields in section zero is not filled out, or if one of the attachments that is required is not uploaded, then you'll get a message that says, um, that it, an attachment that is required is not uploaded or that there's some information that was requested that is not uploaded. And so then you'll just have to go back and, and um, provide that information. When you hit the review button and, you, and everything is there, you'll get a green bar and it will say you're ready to submit. And then you can click that submit final application button. Once you submit, once you hit that button, you actually, you can't go back and then change your application without contacting staff. If it's before the deadline and you realize something changed or you realize that you made a mistake and you do wanna go back, you can contact staff and we can reopen your application for you and you can make those changes and submit again. But it just is another step in the process. So try and make sure that you're, you are actually done before you hit that submit final application button. And then these are just a few tips um, about kind of preparing your grant application. And it, like many of our lists, it certainly is not comprehensive. These are just things that um, we wanna elevate for people and make sure that um, you're sort of attending to. The first is really just start early. Um, I think writing grant applications, I know I've written a lot of grant applications. It always takes longer than I think it's going to. And so we just really wanna encourage people to start early. Spend time choosing the right application because it does impact how your application is scored. So just really make sure that you have chosen the right application. Going back to the, um, the flow chart decision tree that it was earlier in the presentation is a good place to you know, just double check and make sure that you actually selected the right application. Read through the questions, the scoring criteria guidance and the other RFP material carefully. You wanna make sure that you know what you're getting into and that you have um, complied with all of the requirements of the grant and um, that, you, that you're good to go. For project partnerships, it is really important to pay attention to who the lead applicant organization will be because it, will, it could impact your score. So they're really, from the city's perspective, we can only have a contract with one organization. And so that's gonna be one grantee. And it could be that you're coming in as a, as a coalition, you're coming in with partners and you all have sort of equal decision-making authority. And we, you know, it's, we saw some of those applications last time. It's great to see those. But we want, but there can, there still will have to be one lead applicant and that's the person um, and that organization is the organization that we are asking for demographic information about. So we're asking demographic information about their board and about their staff and about their staff leadership. And 
there is a criteria worth about 10% of the total score that um, where that you can only get full points on if, if the applicant organization reflects the priority population, the PSAC priority population that the project is intended to serve. So for example, if you have a project that and you intend to serve the Latinx community, you would you would not be able to get full points unless your organization had more than more than 51% of your staff were and more than 50% of your staff leadership and more than 50% of your board were Latinx people. So just wanting to make sure that you pay attention to who's in that lead applicant position. Also pay attention to program requirements. I think I mentioned those before. Sam mentioned the wage requirement. We do, everyone who gets paid with PSEF funds is does need to make 180% of area median or area minimum wage. And um, in 2022, that is $26.55 an hour. That was in the ballot initiative and it's now in the city code. So it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty firm line on that one. And also pay attention to reporting requirements. Some grant programs require that reporting, kind of the cost of reporting be absorbed into overhead. We, um, we are asking for some pretty detailed information from grantees um, once they start their projects and, and get reporting. And so we want you to think about how much time that will take and really budget for that as a direct project expense. It doesn't need to be part of your, it doesn't need to be included in your overhead. That's a project expense. So build the budget that you need to be able to be successful in implementing your project. And then the last two bullets are really just kind of encouraging folks to take advantage of the information sessions like the one you're at right now. We have staff office hours two times per week um, during the course of the open application period. Um, there are resources on our website and um, we're available to answer questions if something is confusing or you just aren't sure how to proceed with the application. I'm going to turn it back over to Sam for these next couple of sections, but I did want to see if there were any clarifying questions real quick. I think there was, I just, I, there was a follow-up question about the per year, and that was from Laura who said, so if I'm asking for a two-year, $300,000 per year grant, is that a large or a small grant? And the answer to that is it's large. So, because it would be a $600,000 grant, so over $500,000. Oh, and I just saw that June already answered that question. So now Laura really knows. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sam. Great, thank you, Katie, I appreciate that. So in this next section, we're gonna just go to a couple slides and we're gonna talk about how the precess proposals are chosen for funding, All right? All right? So the application review process is designed in order to ensure accountability to the program goals, which come from the initiative, the ballot initiative that 65% of voters voted on. It's also there to ensure accountability to the communities that are most vulnerable to and impacted by climate change. We're talking about communities of color and low-income folks. It ensures accountability to the city's climate action goals within the city, and it ensures trans accountability to ensuring transparency, as well as consistency and scoring. So that is what ultimately the application review process, the scoring criteria and framework were designed to do. And it also helps us know where to spend resources over time to help applicants that are led by and serving our priority populations and figuring out how to help them be successful. So it helps us calibrate that over time. That's what we have this process here to do. And lastly, the application process has been vetted through several public comment sessions, a lot of feedback from the public. And so many folks within the community have had an opportunity to weigh in on the scoring criteria that is a critical part of the application process. And so the voice of the community in many ways is there. And that's, that's how we ensure accountability to, to the community more broadly. <clears throat> All right, next slide. So this slide here just shows a, a, a simple diagram or visual to describe the application review process. In the far left, you have in your first box, it's the first step. 
when the applications when the application period closes on November 30, the first thing staff is going to immediately do is begin eligibility screening. What we'll be doing there is reviewing whether projects meet our basic eligibility criteria. A lot of this is yes, no. So it's does the project fall within the city of Portland boundaries or are you training city of Portland residents? Is the project being submitted by a nonprofit that is registered with the, with the state and so forth? Does the project's proposal fall into one of our funding areas? Does it align with one of our funding areas? And so that is a pass fail. And so projects either make it past that eligibility screening or don't. Once they get past, if they do get past the eligibility screening, the next phase, and that's the next box, is the technical review. Now, this only happens for projects that have a physical improvement happening on them. So it's not for workforce development projects, for contractor training projects. It's about those that, are, that, are, that have a physical element to them. And we're reviewing whether or not the project can be implemented as designed. Can it get the permitting? Is the project actually feasible as, as it's been proposed and designed? And so it's not necessarily, this isn't about best practices, but this is about is, there, is the project technically feasible. And this step is completed by staff. We've got um, technical experts within other bureaus that we will tap in based on the, the specific project area, that the, the specific um, scope that the project is proposing. So if it's a multifamily affordable housing project, we may tap our, our, our colleagues from the Portland Housing Bureau to help us with that review. The next step in the process is where we go through a potential narrowing of the application pool. And so this is where every single application that makes it past the eligibility and the technical review get to this next phase where at least two staff members review every single proposal and they do the preliminary scoring. And so this is where some proposals, if they do not meet the minimum score, and the minimum score is about you have to get 50% of the total points for your given project in order to pass this phase, then you may not, a project proposal may not move past this phase. And then finally, the next phase is where the project gets scored by not only staff, but our PCEF committee members, uh, a cohort of community members that we've brought on board in order to support us in the scoring. And so there are a range of folks at that phase that, that, that get to score proposals. And each proposal is scored by a panel of three to five folks. Um, and we ensure and we work to make sure that each panel has a majority of people of color on the panels and is gender balanced on the, on the panel. And lastly, once we move past that scoring, then the staff create portfolios for the committee's full deliberation and the full committee deliberates on packages of proposals and ultimately make the final funding recommendation on which portfolio they're gonna advance for, for city council to make a decision. And so once the committee makes their final funding recommendation, it goes off to city council to make the, to make the final decision. Okay, and so, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and I see a question. So I'll pause because the next section we're gonna move on to talk about just the application assistance resources available. And so I've gone ahead and I see this question from Kelsey. It's, is it possible to get a breakdown of application scoring percentages? It was mentioned that the lead applicant organization being, refl being reflective of the community they serve is 10% of the scoring. Yes, uh, Kelsey, this is possible. This is within our application materials that, that Katie had uh, pointed to earlier. On our application website, if you do navigate over to the application packets that, that you would download, um, the, uh, each of the applications do list all of the scoring criteria as well as what it takes to get the maximum points. With that, I'll send, send it back to Katie to speak to just a little bit about the application assistance that's available. Okay, so um, I mentioned some of it before and you're attending some of it now, but there is a, a lot of application assistance that's available during the open application period, which is from September 20th when we release the RFP until um, November 30th when the, when the open application period ends. So there's application assistance um, in the form of information sessions, the first two, well, the first one on this list happened a couple days ago. It was our um, initial launch for all interested applicants. Um, it was an information session that was recorded and is posted on our website. So if you want to um, go back and look at it, 
it's a lot of the same information, though, that we're talking about now. The thing that um, might be interesting is that there are some different clarifying questions and there, um, the Q&A session at the end, if you're interested in looking at that. Then the second one is the information session that you're in now. And then we're going to do a third information session on October 11th. Um, kind of over a long lunch hour from 12.30 to 2 p.m. And that um, that information session is for organizations that are led by priority, um, PSF priority communities. The, and then we also have virtual PSF staff office hours. Although I feel like we kind of can drop the virtual since everything is virtual right now. But we have office hours twice a week during the open application period, you can sign up by clicking the link that is a part of this presentation or by going to the website and navigating to it. On the website, there's actually information about which staff people are going to be at which open office hours. And so if you're interested in talking to a specific staff person or like, for example, if you had an energy efficiency project and you wanted to make sure that you went to the office hour where the clean energy project manager was gonna be there, you can see that on the website. And you do want to sign up for those. They're on a first come, first serve basis, and we are limiting the size of them just so that we can hope to have, you know, be able to actually get to all of the questions and have conversation with the people who um, who sign up for those. There are trainings and workshops on grant writing, home energy efficiency and savings, residential and commercial solar, community solar, and permitting. And then there are some technical assistance hours that are available, and those are sort of one-on-one -on -one hours or drop-in hours with workshop trainers. In this slide, I'm not going to read through. Um, it's a good reference, and, but you can see who the trainers are for each of the um, each of the workshops, and then you can get a link to technical assistance hours where you might be able to connect with trainers and kind of. Um, be able to have more one-on-one -on -one attention and conversation to your specific questions. And that is the end of the formal presentation. And so I guess we just invite any questions that folks have um, to put those in the chat or raise your hand and um, ask them out loud. Think Sam, are there, did you want to start? I think we may have had one that was in, that was sort of in the queue. I'm looking, I think there was this comment and I think it was made by Laura. It was that, there was this comment or quite, maybe as a question, it was the, it said that minimum wage for nonprofit governmental organization employees administering the money or program might exceed 20% cap if it's for a full-time job. But what I think I may want to just specify is that the, the wage requirement, this is the 180% minimum wage requirement, which is 2665 as of July 1st of 2022. Now that wage requirement is applicable to anyone who is spending, and I think what we have in our budget table, correct me if I'm wrong, is at least 25% of their time on the PCEF project. So you may have administrative staff that provide support in one way or the other, but they're they're just they're paid out of the overhead. But anyone who's directly paid from the grant as part of their time that uh, is subject to that under 180 percent minimum wage requirement. So it isn't all the staff of the organization because all the staff of the organization oftentimes may not be working on the PSEF project. But um, for anyone who is that would be billing directly to the project, that requirement holds, and it holds for any subcontractors. Katie, please correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I think that that's right. I guess the only clarification I would add is that the 20% is really just a cap for overhead costs. It's not a cap for staff costs. So if you're billing directly to the project and making that twenty six fifty five an hour, that doesn't go toward the 20% overhead cost. I see Shantae's hand. Hi, yes. Um, I had a, a question about the minimum um, wages that um that you all wanted to make sure that folks met um around the $27 an hour for smaller organizations like after they receive that funding um for a while and what what's going to happen if they can't sustain that $27 an hour after the grant is PSEF going to commit to supporting those smaller organizations ongoing or is there a plan 
um, in place because I'm just thinking like once you start paying people $27 an hour, you know, you can't just do that for three years and then drop them down to like 20 or 18. So I was just curious if there was any thought around that. I, I, Sean, I think our best, our best, you know, answer for that is, you know, at least as it relates to small grants, it's three years, you know, this, and, and, and for large grants, it's five years. And there certainly isn't anything that's going to prevent folks from applying year over year to continue their project proposals. But there isn't, outside of uh, the, there isn't anything there outside of when an, org an organization is receiving funds from the program, when they've got a grant in the program. So once that grant obligation is, is fulfilled and if they no longer have a grant with us, then then that is it, and that, that is going to be that is going to be the challenge. I, 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 I was honest. That is the challenge, and um, the, unfortunately, that that's something we're happy to think through in terms of thinking through and other funding sources. But um, but our role with an organization ends once the grant agreement ends, and formally in terms of providing that financial support. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I was just curious because um, yeah, I was just curious about it. Maybe I could just, if I could just add one thing to that, I know that there are some funders who have, um, who kind of have a desire to like fund organizations and then like um, reduce the amount that they're funding those organizations and then stop funding them and kind of move on to funding other organizations. And there's nothing right now within PCEF structure that is like that. So in, if you are doing good work, if an organization is doing good work that is addressing climate change and advancing racial and social justice, there's no, nothing um, as we're currently structured to that would kind of prohibit you from just getting another grant for another three or five years and, and continuing to, um, to get funded through PSEF. Are there any other Shante, questions? What I, Oops, sorry. What I will ahead, park there. out there. No, no. And Shante, what I will just park out there is, is hold, 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 hold that comment. I, I think don't don't let go of that comment because I think there's, there's valid as folks extend to other areas, other geographies where we may not be able to fund it. That still is it's it's hard. And so I think we're at the start, but this is our code as it currently stands. And um and so there there there's always an evolution of a program, but but right now it is it is in our code. Thank you both for, for taking a stab at that for me. Welcome. A a any other questions? And obviously, this isn't going to be the only time for folks starting to just open this up and starting to think about those proposals, but. Wanna 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 encourage folks. If you've got a if you had a, a seed of a of question, please please do raise it. We're happy to take any questions. Uh, we've said this before. We've gotten really used to long periods of uncomfortable silence, so we, we, we will <laughs> sit here and give give more of that space. Um, and uh, and certainly hang here for 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 a good bit longer. We'll also give folks the evening back too when it makes sense. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Shante. Thank you, Nathan. Likewise, Kelsey and, and Marianne.
Interesting. What if we say we give it about another couple of minutes to 6:40? So now, now the clock the clock is there. You got you got a couple of minutes. One of these days we will purchase our own music rights so we can have music in the background so we can keep going and not get booted off of YouTube for. Angela. I think we got 30 seconds and counting, folks. Well, just want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. I know it's it's, it's hard and appreciate you all showing up. Um, and so we hope you all know, you know, you, you come check in with us as you have any questions that that door is wide open and really encourage you all to check in with staff, come visit our office hours, email us at clean energy fund, um, uh, Portland, clean energy fund at Portland, Oregon .gov. Um, but, but otherwise, um, hope you have a good night, get back to your families and, and, and we'll see you next time. Thanks all. Just a big kudos, a big kudos to, yeah, and a big kudos to June. I well, you should have acknowledged from the outset for 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 making all this go as smoothly as possible and, and managing your questions in the chat and just being the mastermind behind pulling this together.